for example, there's one study in which retired older people, they had to spend 15 hours a week in a public elementary school for one year. Yeah. And so they agreed to do that. And there's another group of older people who didn't do that. It was a very, it was a randomized control trial okay. funded by MacArthur Foundation. And so at the end of the year, they found that the kids were very happy. Their grades went through the roof. They were did very well. Older people, their physical health improved, mental health improved, cognitive function improved. Mm -hmm. The biomarkers of age and stress Decreased. in their blood and being improved. Wow. And and look at and take this. The volume of hippocampus in the brain on MRI was larger in these volunteers at the end of the study. Welcome to Permission to Heal. I am Marcy Brockman and I am so glad you're here. In this podcast, we engage in meaningful, deeply human conversations, using our voices to inspire connection, compassion, understanding, empathy, and wholehearted wellness. I want you to find the courage to transform yourself no matter what others tell you. Only you can give yourself permission to trust yourself, permission to take care of yourself, permission to follow your heart and desires, and build a life of love, home, and belonging. Through sharing our stories, we will help each other to heal and create the healthy, meaningful lives we richly deserve. We only need our own permission to begin. Hello and welcome to Permission to Heal. I am Marcy Brockman and I am thrilled that you are here. Today on episode 48, I have a very impressive man, um, Dr. Dilip Jeste. He is a Senior Associate Dean for Healthy Aging and Senior Care, Distinguished Professor of Psychiatry and Neurosciences, Estelle and Edgar Levy Memorial Chair in Aging, the Director of Sam and Rose Stein Institute of Research on Aging, and the Co-Director of the UC San Diego IBM Center on Artificial Intelligence and Healthy Living. He is a geriatric neuropsychiatrist specializing in successful psychosocial aging and the neurobiology of wisdom. He has over 750 peer-reviewed journal articles, 160 book, book chapters, and 14 published books. His latest book is called Wiser, The Scientific Roots of Wisdom, co-authored by Scott Lafee, who's also from UC San Diego also the former president of the American Psychiatric Association. He was the first Asian American elected president of the American Psych Psychiatric Association in its 75 year history list, and he is listed in Best Doctors in America. He is originally from, from Mumbai, India, where he did his medical school and psychiatric training, and he did a psychiatric residency in Cornell, a neurology residency at George Washington University. He was a research fellow and later chief of movement disorders and dementia at the NIH, the National Institutes of Mental Health, or NIMH, before joining UC San Diego. He, he's, his, his resume alone had me sort of shaken in my boots here. This man's the real deal. Um, and he's spent his life researching schizophrenia and neuropsychiatric interventions, and, and his main goal the thing that he is the most passionate about is helping people age healthier and wiser. And, uh, and he, his research on wisdom and the not only um, social and like human historical uh, uh, incidents or, or behavior about aging, He's the most passionate about helping people be healthier and wiser and age gracefully and healthily and have active, meaningful lives with intergenerational connection and community and, and so on. And there are so many pieces of what I think is traditionally thought of as wisdom as just behavioral, um, just stuff you do, um, uh, knowledge that you acquire over time and so on. But but through his research and what we discussed in, in our in our conversation, which you're about to listen to, is the neurobiological connection 
between the growth of wisdom and the increase in mental health and the decrease in depression and so on. And, um, and we really get into what we can each do in our lives like right now to help increase our community mindedness and our compassion and empathy and our um, acceptance and um, patience for diversity and diverse information and diverse opinions about things and go out and make the world a better place by making ourselves happier within community. Uh, you know, with, with COVID especially, and, and even before, Dr. Jeste said, we've had this growing pandemic of loneliness and people are more isolated than they've ever been before and more lonely. And that it's bad for everyone. It's bad for our society at large. It's bad for us individually. You know, there's so much benefit psychological benefit, neurological benefit, um, social benefit, physical benefit to being involved in our communities, to having a, a consistent friend group that you can rely on and talk with and hang out with and laugh with and share the ups and downs of life with, you know, uh, go be creative with people, join a book club or an art club or go like do what like my dad does. He's almost 82 and he's in a in a bridge club and he plays tennis and he's singing and he's in a dramatic group and he's got a large group of friends and all of these things help bring meaning and joy legitimate true joy into his life and and makes the world a, a little more creative and wonderful place um so i hope that you enjoy this conversation with with dr dilip jeste he's uh he's wonderful and again his book wiser the scientific roots of wisdom and the um all of the stuff that you're going to need to look for are, are in the show notes. So you can just scroll down when you're done listening to the episode, including the measurement tool. So you can see for yourself just how wise you are. The Just A. Thomas Wisdom Index Score. Um, scroll down and you can take the little online survey and, and see what, what, what characteristics you need a little bit of work in. We all need a little bit of work. Nobody's perfect. So anyway, without further ado, here's the wonderful conversation. Oh, and thank you so much for listening. I, I should say this uh, more often than I do, but I am so thrilled that the readers, the listenership is growing. I'm so thrilled that you're all tuning in week after week and really en enjoying the conversations that I'm trying to bring to make us all healthier, to make us all a little happier, to bring more joy into our lives, a little bit more meaning so that we can really give ourselves permission to heal. And so please, if you love these episodes, please sh like, please share, please leave comments, please subscribe. I, I can't tell you how invaluable those things are. Those tiny little things that'll take you two minutes. Um, they, they make us more available to more people. So um, thank you so much for listening. Now here's the episode. Hello, hello. Can I hear me? Yes. <clears throat> <clears throat> The Permission to Heal podcast is sponsored by Instacart. If you're anything like me, no matter how you try to schedule your life, you're always super busy. And when it comes to doing errands and grocery shopping, sometimes we need a little help. Instacart is here to help us get our essentials delivered in as fast as an hour. It is amazing. With Instacart, you can do all your shopping online at your favorite local stores, grocery stores, pharmacies, Target, Costco, Staples, Sephora, Bed Bath & Beyond, 7-Eleven, even some liquor stores, and an Instacart shopper will shop for you. All of my Instacart shoppers have been super helpful in choosing my items. If the store is out of what I've asked for, the shopper will text me pictures of similar items for me to choose from and will change my bill to reflect the changes. Then the shopper delivers my items directly to my door and you can choose contactless safe delivery 
and you can choose contactless delivery, which helps keep everyone healthy and safe. I rely on Instacart for grocery shopping every week and sometimes for even my non-prescription drugstore items. Instacart is like having a personal assistant help me with my shopping every week. Get your groceries and essentials delivered in as fast as an hour via Instacart. New customers can get free delivery on your first order of $10 or more. Just click the link below, at which will take you directly to instacart.com so you too can get the help you need. Just click the link below and you can get your groceries and essentials delivered in as fast as an hour via Instacart. New customers can get free delivery on your first order of $10 or more. Instacart.com, your personal and quick shopping assistant. You won't know how you lived without it. Okay. Good afternoon, Dr. Jeste. How are you today? Very well. Thank you, Marcy. It's a pleasure to talk to you. You as well. I've been looking forward to this. I've been devouring your book. It's uh, quite wonderful. Uh, wisdom. I think it's something that we all need, especially now. I, especially now. I think people are not, some people are not uh, remembering their pro-social behaviors, you know. Anyway, so I have questions, but before we get into that, we usually do the six quick questions. Jens, you ready? Okay, uh -huh. what, what six words would you use to describe yourself? Resilient, obstinate. Obstinate? Optimist. Oh, obstinate. optimist. Okay. <laughs> and optimist, both. Okay. Obstinate and optimist. A listener. Of course. Enjoying time with different generations. Okay. Now there is more than one word. I get it though. That's fine. It's fine. Um, okay. What is your favorite way to spend a day? These days, uh, my favorite day, way to spend the day is with uh, our 18-month-old grandchild. Wonderful. There is nothing better than that. Nothing better yes. than a sweet baby. Yes. Mazel tov. Congratulations. That's wonderful. Is this Thank your first, you. your first uh, grandbaby or? or no, we have, we have a couple more, the older one. But at this age, yeah. this 18-month period, it is so exciting i mean they learn something they do something new every day there's so much excitement Absolutely. energy which is um it is infectious so you feel excited and energetic and enthusiastic yeah. so much fun oh yeah oh yeah we but my husband and i have five grandchildren from his daughter we're a second marriage and so from his daughter so i missed all of their babyhoods and I'm having fun with the elementary and middle school ages, but I miss the babyhood. So I'm the pressure's on my own biological children to give me grandbabies. <laughs> miss that. I want to do that again. Um, okay, what is your favorite childhood memory? I was supposed to give a presentation in my class, and I was usually known as the shy cat and um, others were not sure how I was going to do that. So they offered some suggestions. And I must say, I surprised myself by giving a presentation that was pretty calm, controlled. Uh, and it gave me a lot of self-confidence. Wonderful. And yes. That's a good memory to have. Good sort yes. of feed off of that for a very many years you know that the confidence okay. of that is important integral to a young student yeah right. that's great Wonderful. and especially for me because i wasn't i've been always more of an introvert i uh, don't go out to seek new relationships but of course i make them when i have them sure. no, i'm not a social but I'm not most extroverted person either. So that's why it was important for me. Do you remember what the presentation was about? 
This was about something not academic. Okay. So I, I don't remember the details, but it was some trip that uh, we had gone on. Uh, and th that's not something I was known for. I mean, I was a bookworm and sure. I always studied. So, so for me, some kind of extracurricular activity to talk about that openly in front of these other kids and the teacher mm -hmm. was um, um, very gratifying. That's wonderful. And surprising. That's wonderful. I, I like that. Um, number four, what is your favorite meal? Now this changes seasonally That's actually with people. Depends on your mood. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but in a way that's easy to answer. I come from India and uh, I still love Indian food. Uh, and the typical Indian meal actually is not one thing. There are multiple things at the same time. So there are no courses. Yeah. It's like a thali you have when you go to an Indian restaurant. So, so there are some spicy thing, some plant thing, some sweet things, and all at the same time. Yeah. And I, I like, like that those. about Indian food, that there's so much, so many dishes and so many things to taste. Right. And so it, it is, and it, it doesn't matter whether it is vegetarian or non-vegetarian with chicken, fish, whatever, but it is sort of a mixture of spices, sweetness that, that, that I enjoy. Use the whole full range of your taste palette. Exactly. Nice. Exactly. Nice. Okay, number five. What one piece of advice would you like to give your younger self? I would say that how. I would say, believe more in yourself than what other people tell you to. Uh, you have to trust yourself. Trust your instincts. Uh, and even when people say something won't work, don't listen to that mm -hmm. because you are different from others, just like others are different from you. So you don't cope by what the conventional wisdom may be. And if you believe in yourself, you can change. That's wonderful. I, I've had quite a few moments in my life where I, I could I could feel like a diverging path, you know, and most most conventional wisdom would, would have me go one way. And I said, Nope, I'm going the other way. And people said, Nah, it's not done that way. Don't go that way. We don't. And I always said, you don't know me. You don't know what I can do when I set my mind to it. I'm going that way. And it always worked out well, I have to say. And if it didn't work out as well as I had thought, at least I had learned something from it and was able to course correct. Cool. All right, last question. What is one thing you would most like to change about the world? More acceptance. Okay. Uh, more acceptance of diverse perspectives hmm. where we have strong values, strong opinions about something, but we can still be friends with somebody who believes in other ideas or other value systems. And so there is really a need for diversity of perspective, acceptance of diversity, hmm. that nobody's 100% right, nobody's 100% wrong most of the time. And then we need to have that respect for one another's opinion. And that's one of the components of wisdom, of course. Of course, it is one of the components of wisdom. I, I've heard quite a few people, even some people on other podcasts, but people that I work with and people that I know in town who, who have come to the conclusion in their own lives that they can no longer tolerate people of divergent opinions that they feel like, well, how can they be friends with someone who votes against their family, so to speak? And I, it makes the hairs on my neck stand up. You know, mm -hmm. I, I don't quite know what to do with that because I understand, I can empathize with their situation. I can, I, can, I can understand how they feel, but if everybody felt exactly the same way about everything, I mean, that's an impossibility in the first place, but I, I just right. don't think that that's the way it should be. 
right? Because we learn so much from others' views and something we may not accept today, but sometime later we may go back to that idea and say, actually, that was not a bad idea at all. Right. And, and so some things take longer time to sink in, but they can. And so, so long as we are open to this possibility, it's great. Yes, I agree. Okay, so we're here to talk about wisdom. Wisdom. And, you know, I really didn't, until I read your work, I really didn't think that there was a biological, neuropsychological component to wisdom. I thought, like so many other people, that it was just a set of behaviors that were learned over time, that you acquired as you aged, and that was that. But you're here to tell us different. That's quite 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 the thing here yes I mean, wisdom has been an ancient construct it has been described in all the religions practically all the philosophies and it is one of the things that you can find in most of the scriptures in different mm -hmm. uh, religions the word wisdom uh, it really appears in practically all religions all philosophies and from Socrates to others, we can see that in Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, and so on. And yet, empirical research on wisdom is a very recent thing. Mm -hmm. Empirical research, so, so I grew up in, so I was born and raised in India. Yes. I went to medical school there. And like several Eastern cultures, there's the belief that older people are wiser, older right. people are respected. And the Indian scripture called the Gita is thought to be a compendium of wisdom. So somewhere or other that wisdom and aging stayed in my mind as, as I was growing up. But I didn't think much about that until decades later. So subsequently I became a psychiatrist, I became a neuroscientist and and you were studying like and mental, mental illness and stuff, right? Initially, right. weren't you like studying right. schizophrenia and things like that? Schizophrenia. Right. schizophrenia has been my main area of research for many, many years. And I'm a geriatric psychiatrist. Yeah. So I study schizophrenia in older people. And so when I started that work, people said, don't do that because it is so depressing. Schizophrenia <laughs> is serious mental illness. There's no cure for that. And aging is all bad. It's all gloom and doom. Everything goes down with aging. Right. And so combination of the two would be terrible. And yet what I found was that was not true at all. As people with schizophrenia got older, they started doing better psychologically. Wow. Not physically. Yeah, right. not physically. But psychologically, the symptoms improved. They reduce their smoking, drinking. They became more adherent with the medication and other therapies. I don't know if you saw a movie named Beautiful Mind. I did. I loved it. It was so good. So about John Nash. It's true, exactly. It's a true story about this Nobel laureate who was diagnosed with schizophrenia when he was in his early 20s. Mm -hmm. And for the next 30 years, he was in and out of hospital, he received electric shocks, drugs, psychotherapies, you name it, and he had it. He didn't change until about 50. At 50, he started getting better. At 60, he stopped all treatment. He wrote a research paper for the first time after 30 years. And so these are the kinds of people I had seen in my research and I had reported them, but people didn't really think that that was necessarily the case. They said, oh, it cannot be schizophrenia if it improves. But after John Nash's story came out, mm -hmm. I think people began to agree that yes, there can be improvement in schizophrenia with aging. Mm -hmm. And that led me then to think about whether this is something that happens in the public at large also. So we did a large study of people in the community, some 2000 people from age 20 to 100 plus. Wow. We found that as people got older, the physical health declines, 
for mental health improves. People become happier as they get older. And that doesn't make sense. I mean, how can, because then they have so many physical illnesses and, you know, there are social stresses, financial stresses with age. How could people become happier? And that made me wonder whether that was the wisdom that I was brought up with thinking mm -hmm. that wisdom increases with aging. And maybe is that what makes people, older people, happier? So that's how actually I got into research on wisdom and aging about more than 15 years ago. Interesting. Uh, and Interesting. then I found out actually that the research on wisdom actually started in about 1970s in Germany and here in California, but it has been growing. And but most of it is done by gerontologists, sociologists, not by neuroscientists or physicians. And so I really thought it was important to see if wisdom is, how do you define it? How do you measure it? Does it have anything to do with the brain? Mm -hmm. And so that is how we started about research on wisdom. Interesting. I, I do think that my father, who will be 82 in January, is happier than he was 30 years ago. You know, he's got a little bit of dementia and has trouble finding words now and then, and his short-term memory's not fabulous, but he's happier, he's more comfortable with who he is, he knows who his friends are, he has his activities, he doesn't have the stress and the ambivalence and the, the, the uproar of his earlier life. So, and, and I know at, at 53, I'm happier than I was when I was 30, so I, to me, this is increasing. That, that's exactly right. That, that, so when a 20-year-old sees an 80-year-old in a wheelchair, the 20-year-old says, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to grow to be 80 and be in a wheelchair. Who wants that life? If we ask the 80-year-old in a wheelchair, he or she will say, I don't want to be in my 20s again. That was such a terrible period. Right. I had so much stress, so much peer pressure. And I felt I was not doing well. I was so much really stressed out in multiple ways. I had to choose what I was going to do the rest of my life. I had to choose life partner. Yeah. And I always compared myself with others who were doing better. I don't want to be in my 20s. I'm so happy. I may be in a wheelchair, but I'm happy because I'm still alive. Some of the people who are born with me are exactly. not around. I am here. You pair things down to the okay. priorities, right? You, you look at the things that are really meaningful and really bring you, you know, abundant joy in a way that you didn't see decades earlier. Right. That, that's exactly what I call paradox of aging. Yeah. As we age, physical health declines, mental health improves. We become happier. And not just happier, but the components of wisdom. So wisdom is a personality trait. And mm -hmm. it includes empathy and compassion, mm -hmm. control over emotions, self-reflection, yeah. and accepting diversity of perspective. And I think most of us above a certain age, we will say that as we got older, we become more empathic and compassionate toward others. We are not as selfish as we were when we were in the 20s, right? I think that's we don't true. throw... We don't get into emotional outbursts every time we don't get anything. So we have more control over emotions. Sure. When something, go, when something goes wrong, we don't always blame others. We think of maybe I did something wrong mm -hmm. and let me see what how I could do better. So, so we can actually, if we self-reflect, we can see that those components are improving with age. And so... I think there is evidence and scientific evidence now to show that wisdom does increase with age, but with a caveat that this doesn't apply to every single person. Sure, sure. There's, that makes sense. There are some older people who are very unwise and some young people who are very wise, but by and large, we become wiser with age. By and large. So wisdom, as you would describe it, um, has compassion, including self-compassion and empathy, emotional regulation, balancing decisiveness with acceptance of uncertainty, self-reflection, curiosity, humor, spirituality, and openness to diversity. Right. I think I got it right, right? 
Oh, you got absolutely right. Okay, good. So uh, that... how how do you measure that? I mean, I, I there was an article written that uh, in Reader's Digest of all places that quoted you that it was the way the way you answered these six questions to tell us how wise you really are. And so, of course, I I did the little quiz. It's six questions. You scored out of 18 and I got 14. Okay, wise. I'm a wise ass. What can I tell you? Um, but then I found in your book, I, I found um, the, the Just A. Thomas Wisdom Index score. So I went and I took the free um, little survey you have on there. And that was much more, um, um, much more detailed you know, asked a lot more other questions, similar questions that I thought that the, the, the Myers-Briggs typology inventory asked, similar types of questions, but obviously they're, they're being scored or calculated differently. Uh, and, then, and then I looked at my results very quickly and I had over four in each one, but some were lower than others. And I'm gonna make my husband do it for me later and see what his results for me are, because maybe I skewed them, I don't know. Maybe I think I'm better than I am, I don't know. I don't know. No, no. So uh, it's interesting, though. I can tell you, re reading your work, and uh, you are a very wise person. I mean, I, uh, I, I think that you are really you are practicing what people preach, which is empathy, compassion, self-reflection, emotional regulation. Um, uh, no, and I mean that. I think it's, it's really true. It's a process, but coming back but, to your question, but, yeah. how do you measure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and as you said that, you know, I mean, you have been through rough times in your childhood and adulthood, and yet you grew from them, you learned from them, you right. came to believe yourself more, as you said, you gave permission to heal uh, yeah. your, to yourself. Uh, and and so that, that becomes really an inspiration and role models to others. So I, I, I really appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate that so, as well. That makes me feel really good. No, you should, you should. So wisdom is a personality trait and there are scales for measuring personality traits, just like you mentioned Myers Briggs uh, questionnaire. So these scales, they have statements about behavior. Right. And you have to say to what extent you agree or not agree with that statement as it applies to you. Right. So using that, and I have a colleague, uh, Michael Thomas, who is a psychologist and expert in skill development. So he and I, we together developed this scale, which has 28 items called San Diego Wisdom Scale or Jesse Thomas Wisdom Index. And the six items that you mentioned, actually what happened was when our paper came out with those 28 items, one of the newspapers just took six of them and oh, published an article. Oh, they just took some random six. Yeah. They just took some random six and published it as if that was the whole scale. <laughs> it was not. <laughs> so I think it was a quick way off for the newspaper to get something out. And then readers sure. just copied that. So that's, how it came, yeah. that's funny. But coming back. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so the, the way to measure personality is really by asking the person herself or himself. Because there is no objective way of measuring it. But when... He, People complete the scale for purposes like this, they tend to be honest mm -hmm. in the sense, if I'm applying for a job and if you ask me how compassionate I am, I will say I'm very compassionate because of I want course, to get that job. Of course, because you're being right? judged by that. Right. Exactly. But here, you know, for research purposes, I complete a scale. I remain anonymous who completes the scale. And so I get a score. So who cares about it? So most people are pretty honest in completing that. Okay. And so on that basis, so what it does is it gives you scores on each component of wisdom. It is, gives you a score on empathy, compassion, yes. score on self-reflection, score on emotional regulation. And that is very helpful because we all are strong in some areas and weak in some area. And it helps to find out what are our strengths and what are our limitations. Yeah, my, my lowest score was regulating my own emotions. And, and it makes sense, <laughs> it makes sense. It takes me far less time 
to get over being angry or being hurt or being betrayed or feeling like any of those trigger points. It takes me far less time to get over that and balance myself again than it used to, but it still takes some time. It doesn't happen quickly. You know, now it might take two or three days, whereas before it might take months, you know, who knows? Um, but I've, I've gotten better at the pendulum swinging back to n neutral. Right. Okay. So do you think there's, go ahead, go ahead. I'm interrupting you. Sorry. No, no, I, I, this is like, that these changes don't happen overnight. I mean, this, it requires time. Yeah. But if we practice it, consciously focus on that, mm -hmm. things do change. Yes. So do you think there's a, a difference between wisdom in the sexes? Do you think men or women are more wis wise than others? Or do you think it's the same? Uh, so there are differences on different components of wisdom. Empathy and compassion has been consistently found to be greater in women than in men. I mean, hands down, this is absolutely very well established finding. And this is this is an apply only to humans. Actually, this has been shown even in animals. Really? The female animals, yes. Because it is biologically based. I mean, um, think about the whole this. maternal that thing, only, nurturing hmm. thing. That's exactly right. Maternal things, only women produce babies, men don't. And then you can't really have a baby without having a bond with the baby for the baby to survive. And there are biological explanations. There are hormones uh, that help with that. Oxytocin, um, among estrogen, others. Yes, yeah, exactly. And so there's unquestionably biology, even evolution, evolutionary significance for why women are more compassionate than men. Again, the child-mother bond is so unique. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I, so we have two daughters and I'm attached to my daughters uh, also, no question. And yet, really, the women have more influence on their babies than um, men have. So, um, so there is no question that on that component of wisdom, interestingly though, <laughs> It is worth mentioning. Compassion towards self is not higher in women. Well, that I believe. It is often lower. It is lower in women than in men. So women are more compassionate toward others, whereas men are more compassionate toward themselves. Uh, that I buy. I believe that completely. I think that society forever has taught women that their value is in service to others. And right. so that right. has to play into this, you know. Right. right. And likewise for men, again, narcissism is a part of masculinity. Again, because of this traditional thinking that men are the, you know, they are the hunters. They bring the food and that's why the family depends on them. So that's why they are important. The father knows the best. I mean, right. All of those things which help men become more narcissistic and probably the testosterone contributes to that. Mm -hmm. just like estrogen contributes to compassion toward sure. uh, babies and others. So uh, similarly, women tend to be somewhat more self-reflective uh, and more accepting of diverse perspectives. Okay. Whereas men may have more, better control over emotions and they may be more decisive. I could see that. That seems to make sense to me. Mm -hmm. Again, these are kind of stereotypes, and that doesn't yeah, apply. Yeah, it's a little generalization. It doesn't apply to everyone. Yeah. Right. So, so there are differences in wisdom, but I would say, by and large, I mean, women tend to be more wise than men. I mean, there is no question about that. I mean, if you think about a large family, you often go to your grandma for advice. And the that was the next not thing have... I wanted to talk about with you, the grandma <laughs> hypothesis. I love this. Yeah. Keep going, keep going. Okay. <laughs> so, so as I said, so, so I started the research with this idea of looking at wisdom and aging, whether that is uh, really scientifically best. And I found that, yes, it is scientifically best with a caveat, as I mentioned. 
But, and I said that the wisdom probably makes people happier, older people. Mm -hmm. But there is something more to that than happiness. If you think, so I'm a geriatric psychiatrist, right? Mm -hmm. And I always wondered about Darwin's hypothesis of survival of the fittest. Right. What Darwin said, what Darwin said was that animals live only so long as they can produce babies. Because in any species, the old animals die, right? Mm -hmm. And they have to be replaced with babies. Then only the species will survive. Right. So the babies have to be there. That is why animals die soon after they stop being fertile. That happens in lions, tigers, dogs, cats, and I mean, all of these animals. Not in humans. Humans, no. we, we have... Have, the women have menopause around 45, 50. Men have something similar called andropause around really? 45, 50. Yeah, yeah, the testosterone levels drop. So uh, older men cannot produce, uh, cannot, are not fertile. Um, again, the exact age varies from person to person, but by and large, that is true. So if somebody lives to age 90, that means they have spent half of their lifespan mm -hmm. without being able to produce babies. Why does nature allow that? It doesn't make sense because you don't see that in most other species. Right. So what the research has shown is that when the grandma is involved in helping her adult daughter raise children, that adult daughter lives longer, is happier, and she has more time to produce babies. Because if she were only bringing a baby, she won't have much time for anything else. Right. But because now she has more time, because her mom is helping raise grandkids. Another way, another important way of looking at it, when can we produce babies? At the age of 14 or 15. That's when we have puberty. Right. Right? So we see... You know, teenage pregnancies are, you know, they occur. I mean, uh, they used to be very common in the past, mm -hmm. right? And yet the brain actually continues to grow till we are in our 20s. Right. Okay. So we can produce babies when our brain has not grown fully. So we produce babies when we don't know how to take care of ourselves, let alone take care of the babies. Right. Thank like God how for can grandma do that? at that point. <laughs> That's exactly, exactly right. Right. So humans need grandmas for species survival. Makes sense. So, and so that is where wisdom comes into play. That wisdom, even though older people can't produce babies, they help the younger generations. Right. Live longer, be more fertile, and also going beyond fertility. How can you transmit culture from one generation to another through grandparents? Right. Right. It breaks, bre so grandparents, bridges the generations. Exactly. Grandparents are the ones who transmit values of compassion, empathy, emotional regulation. Right. I mean, just imagine a, a you know, teenager with a baby, the teenager himself, his emotions fluctuate hour to hour, minute to minute. Of course. Where is the emotional regulation? That's where the grandparents come in. So humans need grandparents for the survival of the species and for the well-being of the younger generations. Well, and the well-being for the older generation, too. I mean, it's a, a whole reciprocal thing, of course, right? Exactly. 100%. Sure. No, intergenerational activities are very important for both the older and younger generation. But that's where actually as a geriatric psychiatrist, I feel how our society is so ageist. There oh, is so is. much ageism, mm -hmm. which is so wrong. I mean, you know, the number of older people in the population is increasing. We all know that, right? Yes. It is, it is called silver tsunami. Silver That's tsunami. what it is called in media. Silver tsunami. I love that writing is, that down. <laughs> yes. So as if this is a disaster that is happening, that people are living 
into older age. Why is it a disaster? Because older people cost more money for healthcare. Right. And so if we spend the money on older people, we don't have any money left for ch bringing up children. And th that is pure and simple ageism. You know, when the COVID started, and in the beginning, you know, there were mostly reports of deaths in nursing homes, and then the question about keeping the children home, uh, et cetera. Some politicians said that instead of spending money on these nursing homes, let us use that money for keeping the kids in the school. Because these older people in nursing homes, how much oh, longer good. are they going to live? Why are we wasting our resources? Wow. Okay. <laughs> Let's hope that person's not in office anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. And it was not one person. I mean, a number of other people thought, and they actually continue to think along these lines. You often see subtle ageism mm -hmm. in healthcare economics. They often say there's a way in which you can calculate the value of life. And that is based on partly how many years you, you are left. Right. It is so, so wrong. It's so wrong because if we help older people be active, they will be healthier, their healthcare costs will go down, and they will help younger generations become wiser. Right, an invaluable resource. Absolutely. I saw, um, it must have been a video somewhere, a news article, something, a couple of years ago, where a group of people had merged a daycare center and um, an assisted living facility, not quite a nursing home. But so there was the older grandparent generation helping to take care of the two, three, four-year-olds before they entered public school. And the, it was beautiful to watch. Everybody benefited. The little kids got extra attention from grown-ups who could pass along knowledge and wisdom and, and laughter and music and jokes and fun. And, and the older folks got to feel vital and meaningful and, 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 and alive again. It's just, I think that that should, be, that should be everywhere. We should mix daycare centers and assisted livings. Perfect. Absolutely, absolutely. And there's actually a lot of research to support that. For example, there's one study in which retired older people, they had to spend 15 hours a week in a public elementary school for one year. Huh. Okay. okay. Yes. And so they agreed to do that. And there was another group of older people who didn't do that. It was a very, it was a randomized control trial. Okay. Funded by MacArthur Foundation. And so at the end of the year, they found that the kids were very happy. Their grades went through the roof. They were, did very well. Older people, their physical health improved, mental health improved, cognitive function improved. Mm -hmm. The biomarkers of age and stress Decreased. in their blood and urine improved. Wow. And, and look at, and take this. The volume of hippocampus in the brain on MRI was larger in these volunteers at the end of the study. So their brains and the back. control, at least it doesn't shrink. Okay. Unlike it does in the people. So wow. if you don't do anything, the brain will shrink, but in the people who keep active in this way by helping uh, the kids, because they were happy, you know, the older people were happy. They felt wanted. They feel loved by the kids. Sure. And of course the kids feel loved. So just like you said, this is a, win-win situation yeah that's great I, and that's I, what we need to do i know when my my mom was before her addiction got really bad and she was just depressed i said to her go volunteer in elementary school because she loved little kids go volunteer in an elementary school there's one like three blocks away and go once a week and go read them stories or take them to the library or you know, help them with the art or something, Just whatever capacity, feed them lunch. I don't care what you do. And she refused. And I think it really could have helped her in a lot of ways because she just felt Absolutely. so lonely and, and purposeless, you know, and I think that would have given her some more meaning and some intrinsic sort of feeling of value that she had lost. 
I think uh, you, you, you use the exact terminology, which is purpose and meaning. Yeah. And there is, again, there is research on that, purpose and meaning. Uh, we published a paper on that. But so when we are young in the 20s, you know, in the beginning, we are sort of searching for meaning in life. We don't know whether to go into this direction, that direction, etc. Yeah. And the, but as we then choose a, you know, whatever profession or whatever we do, and then and we have family, and then we grow, and then we become contented, and the purpose we acquire a meaning in life. But then comes an age at which we are forced to retire because of the society's needs mm -hmm. or the physical health declines. And then suddenly the purpose disappears and that's where the depression starts. Right. And that's where, again, what you are describing is exactly the solution where volunteering activity to keep purpose and meaning in life is very helpful. Yeah, it's one of the reasons I started this podcast. I know, I mean, I'm a few, quite a few years from retiring as a teacher, but I've been looking for ways to bring meaning in my life to be able to share this hard won, should I say wisdom, um, that I've gained over the last, you know, several decades of my life. And, and I've been trying different things and some things worked and some things didn't feel right or whatever, but this, this I love. So I'm, I'm, I'm jazzed about this. Um, it's cool. Feels great. Yeah. Like you don't mind the hard work, you know, you don't mind the hours cause it's just, feels right like everything's vibing the right way you know love it right that's, that's exactly right i think we have an opportunity to do something that makes us happy and that helps other people you know what is better in life than that right whether something we do that makes us happy and makes helps other people so that's exactly what you're doing and that's what i, I also feel uh, about this kind of research on wisdom yeah that it is a uh, Win-win situation for me too, exactly. Brings a lot of meaning to your life and keeps you your cognitive abilities sharp and and gives back to the world. So that works that works great. So so besides volunteering, what are other ways that people can cultivate increased wisdom in their life? Since I sure. So as I said, there are different components to wisdom, and then we need to look at sort of what components we need help in. And so, so there are different strategies for different components. For example, okay. let's say if we start with empathy and compassion, mm -hmm. right? One you already mentioned is volunteering. Right. There are other things also one can do. One is um, gratitude diary or gratitude journal. So before going to bed, Write a couple of things that made you feel grateful because somebody helped you. But also you can write a couple of things that you that make you feel proud that you did to help others. Mm -hmm. And you don't necessarily even have to write those things. You can talk to somebody about what you did. You can talk to your spouse or your friend or colleague, whatever it is. So, but if you do that regularly, then it becomes our second nature. And we get up in the morning thinking, what am I going to write or think about tonight? So let me do something to help, right? Right. So, so that, exactly. Another is um, just kindness and accepting what is called the sense of common humanity, which is when, if somebody makes mistakes, the first tendency is to blame that person. Why did you do that? Didn't you know that this is a, a, a better way of doing it? Something like that. Mm -hmm. And you, of course, self-critical also. You know, why did I do that? So what is needed is accepting the fact that everybody makes mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. There's no person who is foolproof, right? Of course. So don't necessarily blame somebody because he or she made a mistake. And likewise, don't blame yourself necessarily if you made a mistake. So, so that helps, actually. So that kind of uh, acceptance. And then also realizing that we have been through tough times, but we survived. Yeah. And we'll survive again. And the best example of that, this will come as a surprise to many of the listeners, probably. During the COVID era, during this last year and a half of COVID, 
older people were clearly at a major disadvantage. One, because they are higher risk of getting severe complications. Sure. They were more likely to be hospitalized, more likely to go into ICU, mm -hmm. need ventilator, and more likely to die, right? Sure. Also, because of the requirement for social isolation to spread the older people became even more isolated, unlike younger people, because younger people, they are their smartphones, they have the social media, and so they could communicate. Even. So the geriatric, geriatric psychiatrist, as I said, we expected that we are going to have some major problem with depression, loneliness, social isolation in older people. Right. That you know what sense. we found? What'd you find? What people found? was exact opposite really older people older people had much less depression anxiety and stress than younger people because they'd already survived so many and... decades of things that they knew that they could still survive that's, this that's exactly right for people between 18 and 25 they had never had anything like that so it was kind of the end of the world for them right. they didn't know how to handle it and so they had actually many severe problems, depression, anxiety, stress. Older people on the other hand, they said, oh, we have been through, I mean, we have been through war and drought and um, uh, economic uh, depression uh, and other personal stresses. We came out and we'll come out of this too. Mm -hmm. uh, so so that sense. kind of a realization also is a part of wisdom that once you have that, then that makes you feel better. And that makes you self-compassionate as well as compassionate toward others. It makes a lot of sense. I've survived all these other things. I'll survive this too. And it'll be fine. Right. And so yeah. older people, they found solution, even though they didn't have technology. Some of them learned some technology, et cetera. And so- Yeah, we got my dad on Zoom. What... And we got him on we got him on weekly Zoom calls with the whole family. And we had Connecticut and New York and Florida and Colorado and Texas, like once a week, all of us. And we were in more contact during lockdown than we are normally. Because nobody had anything else to do and everyone was super um, anxious about the whole lockdown thing and and craving more connection. So we I miss it really, because we're not doing that anymore. <laughs> I hardly know what's going on with anyone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But really, it brought the world together in a way, and especially the families. Yeah. yeah. Uh, although physical, physically, but um, psychologically. Yeah, which I think is almost, if not more important. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so, so one of the tricks is sort of finding support and giving support. Mm -hmm. We must do both yeah. because we need support for ourselves when we are stressed out, but we also need to give support to others when others will support us. And so, so, so that's about sort of compassion, self-compassion. Uh, similarly, there are wisdom strategies for emotional regulation, right? So my favorite example, so in California, road rage is common, right? Uh, People yes, quit. I've driven those uh, Los Angeles highways. Yes, I, I know this. Yes. Right. right. So, you know, I'm going to my office. I'm late. Somebody cuts in front of me and I'm so mad at that. You know, I start honking, cursing, blah, blah, you know, and uh, following that and so on. So, so, so how do I control that? I can't imagine you having road rage, Dr. Jeste. <laughs> you seem so calm <laughs> and, not and flexible, you know. <laughs> So, so what I teach is the first thing to do when that happens is actually think about why that person cut in front of you. And I mean, the usual notion is this person is a jerk. I mean, he really is it's an, it's intentionally. On the other hand, is it possible that maybe there is a child on the back seat of that car and the child suddenly had a seizure or suddenly threw up or something right. like that? When, what would you do if you were driving? You would rush you would, you, to go to the emergency room or something, right? Right. So if he was doing that, then why are you getting so mad at that person? That's you wouldn't, correct, absolutely. Right? Right. I don't imagine right. somebody in the backseat having a seizure. I always imagine that the driver really has to pee 
you know. <laughs> and it's also. Uh, and that would yeah. be okay too, uh, you know. What are you going to do? Oh, all right. All right. So, so it is not personalized toward you, but there, there's some reason that right. the person did that. So, so there is one way sort of you reimagine the motive on the part of the other person. And, you know, whether that, that was true motive or not doesn't matter, but it calms you down. Another thing is distract. Increase the volume of the radio music mm -hmm. you are listening to. So then you don't spend time. And the third thing is label that. You can say, okay, you know, I got mad at this person because I deserve to, yeah, absolutely. But let, let me give it over it. I mean, who cares about this person? You know, and I had this happen before I survived and I'm going to do that work. So, so this is sort of how to regulate your emotions. Uh, and again, this uh, road rage is just one example. Sure, there are other sure. examples when we lose, lose temper, we get so angry, so angry. And most of the time, because we feel personally hurt emotionally mm -hmm. by that other person. Right. So when you change that and think that, that the person actually, it, it was totally impersonal, that makes us feel much better. Right. Yeah, that they probably had something else going on in their own head and said what they said or did what they did inadvertently because most people aren't malicious and they don't set out to hurt you. You just have to temper your feelings with your idea that someone else had something else going on besides you, right? I think if we if we think of ourselves as slightly less important in the grand scheme of things, then we're less likely to be offended by the things that other people do. I don't know. It works for me. Um, I, I don't yeah, ever yeah. get the road rage thing because I'm I always listen to podcasts or audiobooks when I'm driving. And for me, if there's more traffic or it takes longer, it's just more I can listen to. You know, I get to listen to another chapter of the book instead of, so I'm there five minutes later. What's the difference? You know? Exactly. It doesn't bother me. I'll stay in the slow that's lane. A, that's a great attitude. That's really, yeah, yeah, yeah. It helps. That's, about, that's what we people need to practice consciously, I think. And that's uh, those who don't have that. Yeah, I agree. I agree. <sighs> Wisdom, wisdom, wisdom. That's so great. This is such a great book. I, I um, People can buy it anywhere online, um, probably in bookstores yeah. as well. Sure, yes. Amazon and yeah, not Barnes and Nobles and other bookstores, yes. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being here. Sure. I mean, one thing you mentioned at the beginning about the society, and that's something I stress actually that, you know, we talk about the pandemic of COVID, right. but there has been a pandemic for the last 20 years, mm -hmm. pandemic of loneliness and social isolation. Yeah. So people don't realize that suicides have gone up by 33% in last 20 years. Yeah. Opioid related, opioid -related deaths have increased tenfolds. Yeah, in the last mom was years. one of them. Right? Right. Right. So sad. Yeah. And the average lifespan in the U.S. dropped two years in a row before COVID. Really? Yes. 2015, 16, 16, 17. What before do they attribute COVID, that to? Because of loneliness and social isolation. Because they, loneliness increases the risk of heart disease, diabetes, dementia, and also suicides, opioid-related deaths. Mm -hmm. That's why, so I mentioned that this is a behavioral pandemic, not a viral pandemic. Behavioral pandemic that has been going on for the last 20 years. And it's a silent pandemic. People don't know that because it's not something you feel. Right, because they're isolated and lonely and, and they're not speaking up. Exactly. And it is not just that, but it has actually biological impact on our physical health, cognitive function. Mm -hmm. The good news is that wisdom is a good vaccine for loneliness. Uh, we have actually published several papers on that, showing that wisdom and loneliness go in opposite directions. People who score high on wisdom, especially compassion, they are not lonely. And there is even biology involved in that. If you look at 
if you do EEG or even microbiome, okay. people who are lonely and people who are wise, they go in different directions. Huh. So what we need is ways to increase wisdom in the population level. Yes. Because we, and we really need that because honestly, the COVID will go away with these vaccines, but if the loneliness continues, they're going to have problems too. So we need to find ways to get ourselves involved with other humans, to build a greater community within our own lives that not only brings meaning and, and all those biological, social, cognitive functions, but helps us live happier and longer and and so on. That, that, that's exactly right. I mean, that is what is needed. And that is the sort of we societal are, wisdom. Humans and, need you know, people. We're, we're uh, and social animals, you know, we, we can't right. survive well solitarily. Right. And uh, uh, once again, research has shown that social connections have greater impact on health and longevity than smoking, drinking, sedentary behavior, hypertension, any of these traditional factors mm -hmm. have less impact than social connections. Wow. So you can counteract some smoking by joining a, joining a group, making right. friends. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, and it is, again, this is That's huge. not sort of feel. Yeah. And it is not feel good TV science. You know, it is real biological science in which uh -huh. studies have shown that this has impact on the biomarkers. It has impact on the functioning of the brain using MRI and other things. So, this is real hard science that supports this. And that's why we need interventions of this kind. And that's why I can I compliment you because what you are doing is increasing compassion at the community level. You know, there is something called compassionate community movement in that started in Australia and New Zealand and now UK. Uh, but we really need to do those things, we need to train younger people in compassion, self-reflection, emotional regulation. Yeah. You know, we we only focus on the hard skills, reading, writing, arithmetic, and sure. now how uh, engineering. We actually need the to things that have economic components. Right. Exactly. We need to teach and reward people in how compassionate they are, how self-reflective they are, how emotionally regulated they are, how accepting of diverse perspectives they are, because we need it as a society's survival. That makes sense. That makes sense. I, I think one of the reasons that my dad at almost 82 is doing as well as he's doing, even with a bit of the dementia, is because he's a joiner. He's always been a joiner. He is in a bridge club and he plays tennis a couple times a week and he's singing in a chorus the geriatric chorus and he's you know in this little dramatic group and and none of them can memorize lines anymore but they they hold up the script and they emote you know and they have their family and their friends come and they do a little performance and you know it keeps him active keeps the 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 brain cells firing and and he loves it he loves it. He loves it. It's great. And I, I think great. when That's he's in great. Florida and he has those things at his fingertips, I think he does better than when he's in New York. Because although he's closer to his his daughters in New York, he doesn't have the same community as he has down south. So, um, yeah. So he's with sure. the COVID thing has missed some time down there. But mm -hmm. what can you do? <laughs> Yeah. You know, better but, but, better to go without the, the group and still be alive than, you know, right, right, right. you have to temper these things a little bit. Yeah, yes, it's yes. important to know. I mean, I, I think there are a lot of people who wonder what they're going to do when they retire. You know, I have had a, quite a few friends over the last few years retire from teaching. And, you know, there's only so many wineries you can visit. You know, <laughs> you have to do something. And, uh, and I don't know if enough people, 
and whatever we can quantify as enough without judgment are are looking for community based um social based things that they can do that not only is fun for them but brings meaning to the lives and gives back to the community a bit you know i mean okay. that would be okay. that would be great so i think we need to start forming some more clubs <laughs> right okay. right absolutely and, absolutely and this is good for everybody i mean again it has biological impact again things like uh, the social connections meditation mindfulness yeah i mean they actually improve volume of certain areas in the brain they increase the white matter integrity they reduce the stress biomarkers so again as i said this is not just feel good tv science it is hardcore science yeah. that shows that these things are good for our brain and body fabulous let's do them all now <laughs> <laughs> excellent i i think that everybody who's listening can think about the things in their own life that 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 they can add, you know, like go call a friend, go make arrange a Zoom call with your high school friends or with your work friends or with your sisters or whoever. And, you know, if you can't get out to go someplace, because, you know, some of that is limited in various parts of the country, you know, you could go for a walk, you could go for a swim, you could, you know, ha make a phone call if nothing else. And um, I think that that would help, you know, like, create clubs around books or a shared activity that you all like. Um, there was somebody on your Facebook page, a, a group of 80 some year old women started a boogie board club in California. Like yeah. you could create a club around anything, just get together and do some stuff, some active things. And I, it's so important. It's absolutely so important for, for 20 some art years of my life. I sang with a local community chorus. And mm. when I first joined, I was, how old was I? 32. And I was probably the youngest person in the chorus by more than 20 years. Well, maybe 15 years. Mm. And mm. and it's, it's, you know, it's aged and people have got left and some people have come and a, young, a lot of younger people have joined. Um, but it's wonderful to see older folks who still are passionate about music and still want to sing. And, you know, we do two or three concerts a year at a local high school and, and we do some of the same pieces, you know, seasonally and lots of new things, depending on what the director wants to give us, but it's so much right. fun and music and performing it and singing it. It's just like lights up my brain and lights up my heart and it's just a, a beautiful thing. So, um, I, I challenge every one of you who are listening to find something that you love and just go grab your best friends and go do it. No time like now. Now. Like, put down this podcast and go do it now. You know. Unless you're driving. And then wait and pull over and, and then do it now. That makes sense. Well, Dr. Jeste, this has been fabulous. I'm, I'm motivated. I'm excited. And I hope everybody is as well. So, um... Thank you so much for your time. This has uh, been fabulous. Thank you, Marcy. It, it was a pleasure to talk to you. And as I said, uh, I, I'm also very appreciative of what you do uh, with you. Uh, your permission to heal. Uh, you do great work. And that's really an example of uh, wisdom in action in the community. Oh, I'm blushing now. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. OK, I'm going to stop the recording, but don't go anywhere.
Thank you for joining me for this episode of Permission to Heal. I hope you found it moving and inspirational. Please remember, you don't need anyone else's permission to trust and follow your heart. You have the power within you. Subscribe to Permission to Heal so you don't miss any new episodes, and please share this with your friends.